I want to just have a word of prayer and start this time. I listened to a piece of music uh, by Daryl Coley. It's called Beyond the Veil. And my prayer for this time is that God would take us beyond the veil, which means the veil is our normal perspectives, what might be called the flesh, our normal outlooks, and that God would take us into a place of deep knowing where we could see who we really are, catch a glimpse of the best and the most awesome sides of ourselves, and live out of the best and the most awesome sides of ourselves. The temptation in ministry, of course, is to live out of the criticism, to live out the disappointments. You can't sustain in ministry living out of criticisms, disappointments, heartaches, programs that didn't work, sermons that didn't go as you thought planned. You do something and the video screen don't work. You prepared the sermon the you know, whole week and all of a sudden you come to church and the person is sick, they missed a cue, these kinds of things. Rather, the goal is to live out of our best selves. So if you would just bow with me in a word of prayer and we'd ask God again, God, we ask you to breathe on these feeble and uh, humble efforts. We ask now that you would take us into a place of deep knowing. We would go beyond the veil we would hear and feel your presence and your spirit. We would find ourselves in a place of joy, of safety. I thank you for the persons who've gathered with me together. I would be diminished if they were not here. And so help me, God, now to receive. Help me to care. Help me to listen. Help me to love somebody in this room as we journey together in these days. We thank you and we bless you. In Christ's name, it is that we pray and let everybody say amen. amen. I want to just tell you a little bit about my story. I um, started out pretty much not really sure that I was called to pastoral ministry. In fact, I was on my way to do an MBA. I graduated college in 1976. I know that seems like ancient history to some of you all. But I graduated from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana in 1986. And in those days, what was hot was to get an MBA. It was hot. So I started studying. I bought the uh, manual for the GMAT. And in the middle of it, as I was studying for the exam, I heard a voice say that you ought not be doing this. This is not you. I proceeded to close the book up and had no idea what I was supposed to do. And so because I had just graduated from college, the pastor of the congregation called me and said, um, the men's day speaker, this is now Thursday, has canceled. And uh, we were looking for a Sunday morning speaker and we thought that since you had just graduated from college and the congregation is so proud that you graduated, we want you to come and be the men's day speaker. And I said, yes. <laughs> don't know why I said yes, don't know where the yes came from, but it indeed, it, it indeed did come and I said yes. And I got up and gave this message. And uh, one of the older sisters in the church said to me, um, son, you were good, but you don't have to preach the whole Bible. <laughs> I covered Genesis to Revelations. <laughs> and from that experience, the pastor said, I'm going to take you over here and meet the president of the seminary because there's something in your life. I went over and met the president of the seminary. And uh, I said to him, uh, I want to be a teacher. I, I really want, what I really want to do is study the history of religions. I want to do a PhD with Chuck Long at University of North Carolina. And my wife won't go to North Carolina. So as soon as she goes, I'm leaving seminary and I'm going to North Carolina to do this PhD program. Well, I got over there and ran into an Old Testament professor at Catholic Theological Union. I was the only African-American and the only non-Catholic in the room. He said, is there a Frank Thomas in the room? I said, yes. I raised my hand and said, I want to see you after class. I was nervous. He took me to his office, the ambiance. You already read this in a book, the ambiance and all of that. And he informed me that I had gifts for pastoring. I said, no, I don't have gifts for pastoring. Church people are crazy. I do not have gifts for pastoring. <laughs> he said, no, we got enough teachers. We need pastors. So at the time, my mother 
was a member of a church out in uh, Matson, Illinois, uh, well at that time it was Chicago Heights, Illinois. It was called New Faith Baptist Church. They had just split, they had trauma. The pastor resigned, they had trauma, they had nobody, and so they knew that her son was a minister. So they said, we don't have anybody, so can you call your son on Mother's Day, because we have nobody to preach on Mother's Day, the pastor just left. I go out and I preach on Mother's Day, they invite me back the next day, next Sunday, two Sundays. Following that, they then say, they call me back, I don't think about it, I'm trying to get to North Carolina. They call me and say, um, we need you to interim until we get somebody. So I said, we think we have somebody in January, we want you to come, start October, just do two months, of, three months of interim and then we'll be fine. When I got there and started the interim, the church started to grow. When the candidates didn't show up, I would preach and the church we began taking in new members. So a contingency of the members went to the search committee and said, if they'll join while he is the interim, why won't they join if he's a pastor? Call them. They came and met to me and said, we want you to be our pastor. No, I'm on my way to North Carolina. I'm trying to do a PhD for him. What are you talking about? Y'all are crazy. You know, no. Anyway, we prayed about it and I acquiesced and became a pastor. We had somewhere between 35, 50 people on a good Sunday. No land, no building, not Nada. I started working in ministry and the Lord blessed it and 18 years later we ended up with uh, 4,000 people, 27 acres of land, went through multiple building programs, three worship services, staff, all of that. I did all that stuff. And in truth, um, at year 12, I needed about a year off. I had a mentor named Vincent Harding who came to me and said, okay, what kind of energy does it take to build an institution? I had no context to even answer the question. I had no context. What do you mean, energy? I'm just, I gotta do this. I'm not thinking about my energy. I'm just meeting, I got responsibilities. I got goals, I'm just meeting goals. So about the 18th year, I burned up and burned out. And uh, because I didn't have an extended time off, I just challenge after challenge after challenge after challenge. A congregation in Memphis, Tennessee said to me, uh, we just lost our pastor, and uh, in our search, we think that there are only four people in the country who can pastor this congregation, and we think you're one of them. And we want you to come. Well, <clears throat> um, in the state I was in, um, I heard God say, go. And so I went. Well, when I got down to Memphis, it was a fight. The fight was on. I walked into, I didn't get a honeymoon. I walked into a straight out fight. My, they fought me from the day I hit that building. The height of the fight was 14 members of the congregation sued us, sued me, they wanted to get rid of me. So they sued the church and sued me to get rid of me. And uh, the result was a long ensuing court battle it lasted for about, hmm, let me see, six years or so. I can say six years I was in court. You know, it was like preaching with a boulder on your back every Sunday. Because when you're in court and it's in the newspaper and on television, people are like, is this Christian? And people will quote scriptures. You know, didn't, didn't Paul say that believers are not supposed to sue each other? That's what I thought. I read the Bible. I was in complete shock. To make a whole long story short, um, we came through that. Uh, the Lord bless. I was vindicated. The appellate court threw the case out, came out of that craziness, and I stayed for six more years. In my last two years of ministry there, I was miserable. What I would do is I would uh, come home and complain and whine to my wife. And she really got fed up with it, and so she said to me one night, um, stop whining about this. Either do something about it, or don't talk to me. Do something. So I went into the sister, and the sisters will understand this, um, and the brothers too, when I said, why don't black women support black men? I, don't, I just, I don't get it. You know, I'm out here doing, why can't, can't can a brother get some love? <laughs> why don't the sisters, y'all sisters, y'all don't support black men, you know? So I went through that phase and then decided that she was right. I need to do something about my situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
then I had a staff, I had a huge staff, I had a senior leadership team, I had all that stuff, right? I had all that stuff going on. And so at the end of the three-day retreat, we were planning the year and doing some strategic planning. They said, oh, we want to meet with you. I said, okay. I said, we think you need a coach. We think you need an executive coach. Me? What are y'all trying to say? Oh, no, we think you're doing a great job. We just see some gaps and some holes. And so I did the brave thing in front of the staff. I'll pray about it. Thank you very much for your feedback. I'll listen. When I left there, I said, well, why can't a brother get support from his own staff? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so subsequent to that, um, two weeks later, I realized that they were right. So I went and got a coach. So my first two coaching sessions were venting. Uh, I took the attitude, I'm paying you, so I should get to say, I should get to talk, you should get to listen. So I vented, poured out. Second session, I still vented. She couldn't get a word in edgewise. I mean, I was rolling. I was stuff I've been wanting to say, I, you know, say it, I say it, I say it. Third session, I started like that. And then she said, can I interrupt you? She said, what kind of God do you serve that would sentence you to this kind of misery? I'm like, you know what? You messing with my theology. Matter of fact, that's such a deep question. I can't even answer it. I need a week. In the meantime, I thought about that. And I came back. She was not a particularly Christian person. Uh, and I said, I thought about the question, and this is my response. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? There's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for me. I explained to her the theology behind that. There's a cross. She said, ministry for you is a cross then. I said, yes, it is. She asked me, she said, um, do you think the cross was a cross for Jesus? She said, <clears throat> do you think Jesus had to go to the cross or he wanted to go to the cross? I said, you know what, you messing with my theology. <laughs> Next week, I'll be back. <laughs> so I thought about it, and then I came up on this Hebrews 12 too, who for the joy set before me, do at the cross, despise the shame. You know the text. It was for the joy he endured. So she said, well, uh, ministry for Jesus had joy, and yours seems to have so little. What would it take to take your ministry from a have to to a want to? I said, I'd have to leave pastoring. First time it came off my lips. You would expect some great catharsis, you know, where you break down in tears now that you finally said it. I was completely calm. She said, what would it take for you to leave pastoring? I said, I need a plan. And so she and I put together a plan, much of which I hope that in reading the choice you've read in the book. And so what I've learned, I've been up, I've been down. I've been golden boy. People invite me all over the country at the church growth expert. I've been in newspapers with a mug shot. I've been invited. I had people that wouldn't touch me, wouldn't speak to me, because I was in a newspaper. I was convicted of contempt of court by a judge, given 18 counts of uh, contempt of court, sentenced to seven days in prison with $50 per fine. The Sunday after I was convicted, I watched 500 people walk out. Now that I was convicted, um, it must be true. And so I said, like, you know, that section over there, um, well, maybe it's just an off Sunday. They'll be back. Say, hey, they'll be back. Next Sunday, still empty. Next Sunday, and it dawns on me, they're not coming back because they believed what they read. So I say that to you, say, I've done ministry. I've been up, I've been down, I've been over, I've been under. I've had great victories, and I'm doing well. But this is what I learned. If we are not operating according to our passion, we don't have the ability to sustain with joy the ministry that God is calling us to perform. 
And if we cannot sustain it with joy, it becomes a burden. It becomes a have to. And once it becomes a have to, it's a duty, it's a responsibility, it's a burden. And you'll be like me. I had platform. I was in one of the largest churches in the denomination. People inviting me everywhere to do everything. And on the surface of it, I had members. I had a fabulous choir. I had all of the trappings. But I hated going to that church. The only thing I liked to go do is preach and go home. I did not want to go to meetings. I did not. I would I'd go by the hospital. I'd do something that involved direct contact with people. But the institution, we had 460,000 square feet of space under roof. I know more about tuck pointing and roofs than I ever thought I'd want to know. Replacing, we, we ended up doing $3.2 million loan to replace the HVAC. I learned more about this stuff than I ever wanted to know. And what I've come to is a definition of success. So what is your definition of success? Buildings, numbers, I don't know. I only can tell you what mine is. My definition of success is, do I like it when I get up in the morning? When I get up in the morning, am I excited about the day? When I got up this morning, I was excited to be here with you all, anticipatory. I text my wife out in the hall, fired up and ready to go. <laughs> She says, I'm praying. I say, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm excited because I'm living my passion from the inside out. I hope you read the book so you know that inside out is to, according to the world, success looks like. But when you live inside out.